and welcome back. Today in this um, segment, what I'd like to talk with the class about is about something that's a little bit different than what we usually talk about when we talk about information technology. A lot of times when we talk about information technology, we are thinking about the newest gadget, the latest features that are available from uh, technology companies, uh, maybe the missteps that companies have done or the blunders they have uh, made. Uh, today I want to take a step back and I want to draw out um, some preconceived notions that we might have about what the way forward looks like in technology. And I want to talk about this using the word narrative. And so using the word narrative uh, is a word that describes a story that we tell about visions of the future. We can use narratives about other things other than the future. But in the case of technology, we're going to use narrative to talk about visions of the future because the stories that we tell ourselves about what technology is doing and how technology is used and what we're going to do with technology and what we're hoping technology will bring create a narrative or a story that helps us to position ourselves in history and in the development of technology. And the critical thing that I want to think about is that it helps us try, it helps us to make sense and helps us to determine what's progress and what is a thing that makes sense for the future. The things that help us to um, understand what makes sense for the future are things that fit into our narrative or our story about what technology is doing. And there's always different narratives that are um, trying to be told, uh, that people are telling about what technology is doing in order to fit their worldview, in order to fit their goals, in order to make sense of what's happening around them. There are a lot of different narratives. Some of them may be contradictory, meaning that some stories that people tell about what technology is doing may not be compatible. They, they may not actually both be able to exist at the same time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong. You can imagine one vision of, of the future involves um, Microsoft releasing a particular kind of technology first, and a different, a different narrative of the future would have Google um, releasing that technology first. Those are two contradictory narratives that aren't necessarily wrong, but they help us to think about what's going to happen in the future. Some narratives about technology, where, the, where technology has come from and where it's going, are wrong. They're wrong because they don't account for things that we actually can observe that have happened and just are not in the line with data that we have um, showing pretty clear trends about what the future is going to be like. So let's think about some of the um, technological trends that we use and a lot of times aren't even really conscious of. Um, let's look at four of them. The first one that I want to talk about is one that's broadly called Technological Determinism. And this book here by uh, Smith and Marx um, talks a lot about it and how technology, it's called Does Technology Drive History? And it talks a little bit about that. Technological Determinism, and I'll read the slide here, is a reductionist theory that presumes that a society's technology drives the development of its social structure and its cultural values. The first major elaboration of technological determinism came from Karl Marx, whose theoretical framework was based upon the idea that changes in technology and productive technology are the primary influence on the organization of social relations and that social relations and cultural practices ultimately revolve around the technological and economic base of a society. Marx's position has become embedded in contemporary society where the idea that fast-changing technologies that altered human lives is all pervasive. So to encapsulate the idea of technological determinism, this is a story that we tell ourselves about the way that technology functions. And what technology determinism would tell us is that when technology is introduced, it changed the way the world, the way the world is going to function. And it's often considered as being, um, as being inevitable, that technology will come that drones will start delivering packages, that we will be voting through online computers, that we will be wearing digital contact lenses, and that these things are inevitable, and that there's nothing that you can do to stop them, and that they will change society. And in fact, they are the things that change society. So this is one way of thinking about technology. It is a narrative. There are some pretty clear ways in which it's not correct, though. Yet historians who have looked closely at where technologies really come from generally support the proposition that technologies are not autonomous, meaning they don't come from nowhere, they're not 
necessarily going to change the world, but they're actually social products that are susceptible to democratic controls. There are ways in which we can control the which technology gets introduced into our society. and We're not necessarily going to have to succumb to the ways in which uh, technology gets introduced. But the idea, the first narrative, the narrative of technological determinism says that technologies are inevitable and inexorably change societies. So when I, when I bring this up and with the other ones, what I want you to understand this is, as, is a way in which we talk about technology implicitly, that we say things about technology that imply that we have no control over them, that they're coming no matter what, and that they're just something that we're going to have to deal with. When we take a step back and we talk about this as a narrative, we talk about it as technological determinism. A competing narrative, one that has similarities but is not the same, is one that was introduced in 1990-1991 through an article in Scientific American called The Computer for the 21st Century. And this article has been very influential. It's by a um, researcher named um, Mark Weiser. And he introduced the idea of ubiquitous computing. And ubiquitous computing is a narrative that says that computing is progressing in waves. And each wave is causing computing to be more deeply embedded in everyday life until that computation is actually invisible and seamless. All right, so this is a different way of talking about technology. It's similar to technological determinism, but not, not exactly the same. And the way that um, a Wiser positioned this is in kind of um, three phases, but since um, I'm a computer scientist, when we count, we start with zero. So I'm going to start with zero and say this is the zero wave, or the, the, the beginning, was in computerless computing. And this was in the 1930s and 1940s. This is when people like Church and Turing were working with computers as theoretical technology. They were using um, math and uh, mathematical um, tools in order to establish fundamental limits on computability, what you can do with computers and what you can't do with computers. This is kind of where we are today with quantum computing. If you think about quantum computing, they're largely theoretical technologies, and yet there are people like Church and Turing today who are doing um, conceptual and mathematical analyses of quantum computers to tell us what the future will be like when quantum computers are um, built, if they're built. Weiser's first wave of computing was really mainframe computing. This was in the 1960s and 1970s. This is when we had massive computers, not very many of them, uh, that were doing very simple data processing, but were, were largely influential. There were very few of them in the world, and they were largely at big companies, um, universities, national research laboratories, where they were doing things like processing large amounts of financial data, doing mathematical and scientific simulations. The second wave of computing was desktop computing in the 1980s and 1990s. This is when business applications were driving usage, when Microsoft became prominent, when one computer per desk, at least at the office, was the norm, and computers began to be connected into intranets to a massive global network that we know of today as the internet. So although we talked about in previous lectures about the internet starting in 1969, it wasn't until 1980 or 1990 where the internet started to make inroads into the business environments in which desktop computers were located. All these computers in this wave were wired. The third wave would be what Weiser described as ubiquitous computing. And remember, this was 1990 when he was making these predictions and he was looking forward to an age which we would probably say started about the year 2000. Maybe we'd go a little bit further into the future, 2007 with the release of the iPhone, in which information creation, access, and communication are really driving usage, as opposed to business. Uh, in this case, there are multiple computers per person, uh, per environment, words like WANs, LANs, personal area networks, ad hoc networking, and wireless computing became prominent. And this was the first stage at which we started seeing computers disappear. Not in the sense that the computers became physically invisible, but that our usage of computing started to be independent of the interface that we're using. We stopped paying attention to the fact that we were using computers, and we started working through them instead. So this is a, this is a narrative that said we started with one computer in the, in the first wave, one computer and many people. In the second wave, computers were one to one. And the third wave, there were many computers to one person. And so this is a competing narrative, a second way of thinking about the progression of information technology over time that helps us to understand what's happening. It's, comp it, it's um, compatible with technological determinism in many ways. In a nutshell, it says that technologies are becoming more embedded, more seamless, and more invisible.
and that this happens in waves.